Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship in this awesome day that God has given to us. We're so glad that you could join us today. And a special welcome to those of you who may be brand new to American Lutheran. We welcome you and hope that you feel at home and that perhaps you'll make American Lutheran your church home. We would love to have you do that. Uh, if you are brand new, we'd love to have you fill out one of these welcome cards and let us know that you're worshiping with us. We'd love to answer any questions that you might have about the church or the ministry here. And so thank you for doing that. Also, if you brought an offering today, uh, we thank you for your partnership in the ministry of our church. The, uh, there's two places you can leave your offering. And there's a box on the way out in the center here, and there's also a box uh, around the corner on this side as well. So thank you for that. You can also put your welcome cards in there. Special shout out to those of you who are with us online. Thank you for joining us today as well. We will be offering Holy Communion as the service concludes today. So if you would like to receive Holy Communion, we ask that after, as the prelude or the postlude is being played, that you would just make your way forward and we'll share that with you as the service concludes. As well as if you would like to have personal prayer, we have prayer partners over here, and you'll see the sign that says personal prayer, and you can just uh, be over there. Someone with a lanyard that says prayer team will join you, and I'll be able to offer any personal prayers that you might have. Can you say next Sunday? Next Sunday. It's really important that you say next Sunday. Next Sunday. Because if you show up at 8, you're going to wonder where everybody is. We are going to only have one service. It's Reformation Day, really exciting to celebrate all that it means that uh, God has, is, has and is reforming His church. One service at 10 a.m. right here in the sanctuary, and we would love to have you uh, come be a part of that. Um, we will be offering Holy Communion uh, during that service as well, so just uh, be aware of that. And then on Monday the 30th, we actually have something pretty special that uh, is being offered. Uh, Cornerstone Chorale and Brass will be in concert Monday the 30th at 7 p.m. right here at the church. And uh, there's no uh, cost, but they do ask for perhaps a $10 donation if you would be willing to do that. Also, Dr. Dave, wave your hand, Dr. Dave, so everybody knows who you are is uh, setting up host homes for some of the musicians. So if you would be willing to help with hosting uh, uh, one or, or so of the musicians, contact him and he'll give you the details for that. Also, did you know Christmas is around the corner? <laughs> I know. I mean, Costco has been putting Christmas out for like the last two months, so I don't feel like I'm too far ahead of the game. But Christmas is just around the corner, and we always have a great experience, musical experience here called the Yule Fest. And then there's going to be a Christmas dinner, a magical dinner following. Space is limited, and there are tickets that uh, you need to, uh, to purchase for that if you would like to be a part of it. So we encourage you to uh, check that out. Tickets will be on sale soon, uh, beginning next Sunday. So if you would like to uh, be a participate in that, uh, you can check that out as well. Or just call the church office, and I'm sure they can help you there. Also, to prepare for Christmas, our, our scout troops that are here at American Lutheran are going to be offering Christmas wreaths for sale uh, this week and next week on the, the church patio. So if you would uh, like to purchase a Christmas wreath and support our scouts, you're welcome to do that as well. One other thing, uh, Dr. Dave, this just in, uh, said that they didn't quite get all of the hymn of praise uh, included in the bulletin. So we're going to just skip over that. So if you're wondering why we're not doing that, uh, that's why. So, okay, let's uh, open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for each person who's here today. Thank you for those who are with us online. Thank you, Lord, that we get to proclaim your name. Lord, we need you. We need to be renewed by you. We need to be renewed in our call to serve you. 
and to live our lives for you. Lord, our world needs you. Help us, Lord, to be an effective part of building your kingdom. As we worship, as we encourage each other, as we reach out in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our community, and in our world. Thank you, Lord, for your promise that you inhabit the praises of your people. And so we trust that in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand and greet those around you as we begin our time of worship. We gather today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In your presence we sing and worship you, because you alone are greatly to be praised. It is your name that we love and fear, because you are clothed in splendor and majesty. It is only in your presence, Lord, that we find strength and beauty together. And in all before you, we are encouraged by your spirit to sing your praises, raise our voices, and bless your glory. Mighty God, merciful Father, you have saved your people to bring glory to your name so that we may worship you and long for you. We know that we do not deserve the gifts that you have given us as we often fall short of living the life you would have us live. Hear us now as we open our hearts and silently turn to you and confess our sins. Eternal God, in whom we live and move, have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts. Thoughts and vain desires. 
desires, that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confess our faults, and abide in your grace, and abide in your righteousness, through Jesus Christ, your Son. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ has died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Know that we are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray. First reading is from Isaiah chapter 45. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you the title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things.
The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. The Thessalonians' faith and example. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power. With the Holy Spirit and deep conviction, you know how we live among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Archaea. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Archaea, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell you how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Gospel of our Lord according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And then he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they reply. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. The word of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Lord in heaven, as we take a look at your word today, we ask that you would open our hearts to what you would want to teach us. Thank you, Lord, that you have wisdom beyond anything we could ever realize. Lord, may you instill that wisdom in us by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Great story about a little boy who really wanted $100. And so he prayed fervently for two weeks. He received nothing. So he decided that he would write God a letter requesting the $100 bill and send it in the mail. When the post office received a letter addressed to God, USA, 
they decided to send it to the president. When the president received it, he was so impressed and touched and amused by this little boy's request that he instructed his secretary to send the boy $50. The president thought that the little boy would be impressed with that and would think it was a lot of money. When the little boy received this response, he was delighted with the $50. He immediately sat down to write a thank you note to God in which he wrote, Dear God, thank you very much for sending me the money. However, I noticed that for some reason you sent it through Washington, (laughs) D.C. And as usual, those devils took half of it. (laughs) Today... Jesus is confronted with the politics of his day. I'm going to talk about some politics today. I hope I have a job after today. (laughs) Actually, I'm going to share with you what we Lutherans call Martin Luther's Two Kingdoms theory or two kingdoms theology. It's not really his. St. Augustine had the same idea in his work, City of God. But the idea behind it is that God is at work in both the, the, the things that happen in this world, in the secular realm, in the, in the temporal realm, but God is also doing something in the spiritual realm. I want to go back over this great story with you in, uh, in the gospel because it's such a great and poignant place to begin our conversation. Now remember, we're just building up to the place where Jesus is going to be betrayed and go to the cross. I mean, tensions, political tensions are high within the realm of the Jewish people, particularly the Pharisees and Jesus. They are trying to find a way to accuse him, to make the people see that he is a fraud, at least from their perspective. And so in verse 15, again, it says, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Setting things up, right? Oh, we know you're a man of integrity. We know that you don't do anything wrong. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are, which is very counter to what happens in the political world. Tell us then, what's your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now, you may not know what the imperial tax is, but the imperial tax was what the Romans imposed upon their their constituents in which they occupied their land. The Romans, when they went through, they didn't disband the, the cultures and the governments of the local peoples. They just made them know that they were in charge and they left the local governments in place so that they could continue to govern their people. Part, though, of what the Romans did is they charged a, an imperial tax to the, not the Romans, but to the occupied peoples. So, as you can imagine, no one is excited about this tax. No one thinks, this is a good thing. I'm going to pay the government money out of my pocket so that they can occupy my land. Nobody's excited about this. In fact, this is one of the main reasons why the tax collectors were so dearly loved in the land. (laughs) Most of the tax collectors were local people who worked for the government and worked to essentially steal the people's money. You can see where that's going, right? You're a sellout. You're you're taking money from your people and you're giving it to the enemy. So you can see the tension that's built. And you can see why the Pharisees thought this was going to trap Jesus. If he said, no, you shouldn't pay this tax, well, then he's a, a, a renegade. 
right? And they could report him to the Roman authorities, and the Romans would deal with him. If he said, yes, you should pay, they would say, he's a traitor to us and to our people. They thought they had him, like in many other situations in which they uh, were going. So you got to get the picture. Then Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, and he asked them, this is great, whose image is on there, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied, and he said to them, so give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Kingdom, one. Give to God what is God's. Kingdom, number two. Yes, we live in this world. We have to deal with life in this world. Problem is, is most of us only pay attention to this life. And Jesus keeps trying to get us to realize my kingdom is not of this world. Yes, you have to deal with it. But man, do you need to take time to make sure that you are right with the other kingdom. So if you have your outline, we're going to take a look at what this two kingdom experience might look like. So the first, uh, the first uh, dynamic that Jesus says is to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Or in other words, take care of the things that you need to take care of in this world. It's interesting that this is backed up in Romans by, by Paul in Romans chapter 13, verse 7. Hear this. He says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is actually rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but only for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then drive the speed limit. Do what is right and you'll be commended. For the one who is in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience to do what is right. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Obviously, though, Paul is writing to the Roman people at a time when they had a wonderful Roman ruler who was a man of righteousness. <laughs> Anybody know who was, in, who was the ruler when this letter was written? Nero. A beautiful man named Nero. A man endeared to the Christian people. A man who blamed the Christians for a fire that likely he was responsible for and started the first statewide persecution of Christians where they were brought into the Colosseum as dinner for the lions, as they were impaled and soaked in tar and lit on fire to, to light the, the way to his palace. I mean, this is a great guy. It gives you, you know, warm and fuzzies just thinking about him, right? But it's, isn't it interesting that Paul says that God is the one who has established governing authorities. God is at work, even as crazy and as evil as things might be. However, we know 
that we long for people who rule in righteousness. We long for people who rule in a godly manner. Proverbs 29 verse 2 says, When the godly are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked are in power, they groan. We as God's people are called to live a life of good citizenry. We are called to be involved. We are called to live out what God has given to us in this world. We know that God works through the goodness and the righteousness of his people. And God wants us to obey our governing authorities when the laws and when what we're called to obey is good and righteous. When it goes against God's word, that's when we disobey. Anybody remember a a guy named Nebuchadnezzar? Another guy who gives you warm and fuzzies, right? He was given a vision that he was going to be a a ruler upon rulers, and he created a statue 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, and said, if you worship, or I I require you to worship this statue because I have been given a vision that I'm the head, and if you don't, you're dead. Well, there were three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were, from, who were exiled into Babylon when this happened, and they refused to bow. Nebuchadnezzar had them thrown into the fiery furnace, and you know the story. God saved them out of it. We are called to obey when the laws are right. We are called to disobey when the laws are not right. But Nebuchadnezzar, as crazy and as self-centered and as egotistical as he was, is described three times in the book of Jeremiah as God's servant. In other words, God's working, even through evil people. God is working even through evil people. And our job is to pray. Our job is to live in this world a life that is right and reflects Christ. Our job is to work toward justice. And that is the kingdom of this world, the temporal world. God is working in the midst of evil. And as we look at the craziness that is happening all around Israel, Ukraine, right here at home, you might throw your hands up and say, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah? But it's been doing that for a long time. God is the one who is orchestrating all of those things. Are we praying for our leaders? I don't care if you like them or don't like them. We're still called to pray for them. Are we living in a way that reflects the grace and mercy that we have received through Christ? God is at work in the kingdom of the temporal world But God is even working more in his other kingdom, which brings us to the second thing I want to talk about, and that is to give to God what belongs to God. Let me ask you what God wants. What does he want? He wants you. He doesn't want your stuff. He doesn't care what kind of car you drive. He doesn't care what kind of home you own. He doesn't care what kind of golf score you have. Thank the Lord for that. (laughs) God is only interested in your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. He wants you. Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. We are called to love God. Why? Because that is the only thing that is going to last forever. Your beautiful body, 
This shell that we have is going to pass away soon. My nephew has been working. He's a, my, my nephew's a videographer, and he's working for a guy who literally is doing everything he can to never die. He's 46 years old now. He monitors his health, his sleeping. He monitors every part, everything he intakes. He has a crazy formula. Time Magazine did a, 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 an article on him, and he literally believes that he can thwart death and make his body last forever. Now, I'm probably not going to be around long enough to find out if he's right or wrong. But I'm pretty sure, even if he lives 100 or 150 years, somewhere along the line, that body's going to give out. But your soul, your heart, your mind, who you are was created for eternity. That's the part God cares the most about. He wants you. Does he have you? Do you belong to him? I've always said that for those who love to cross themselves, this is what the cross means if you are a believer in Jesus. I belong to him. That's who I belong to. God loves us. God is literally jealous for us. You say, well, that seems strange to use that word jealousy. Do you know there's good jealousy and bad jealousy? There's healthy jealousy and there's unhealthy jealousy. Second Corinthians 11, 12, Paul writes, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy because I promise to you one husband... Christ, so that I might present you as a virgin to him, that our most important thing is to be joined to Christ. I read an article from Focus on the Family. It talks about healthy jealousy and unhealthy jealousy. It says, particularly in relationship of the marriage, it says, healthy jealousy guards the heart of a marriage because it shows your commitment to the relationship, protects your marriage, by safeguarding the relationship against evil attacks, deepens your openness with each other, and makes you accountable through honest communication and helps you confront major threats to your marriage and head them off before they became major problems. There's healthy jealousy. I've, I've shared this analogy before, and I always like to share it with my confirmation students because it kind of, you know, Goes off. I said, you know, what if I, as a husband to my wife, decided to come home one day and say to my wife, you know what, sweetheart, I love you, I think you're awesome, but I think I'm going to go play the field for a while. I'm going to start dating other women. I'm going to start, you know, being a part of, of other people's life. How do you feel about that? If I were still alive, I'd at least be in the hospital. <laughs> And you say, she's jealous. Yeah, that's a, that's a healthy jealousy. She should be jealous for me, right? Because I am her one and only. We are betrothed to each other. And in Christ, we are betrothed to one God. And God is doing a work in us. The article went on to talk about unhealthy jealousy which is altogether different, and it stems from comparing yourselves to others and feeling inadequate, unimportant, and inferior, and pitiful. We can get caught up in petty jealousy. But the healthy jealousy says, you belong to me. And when I cross myself, it means I belong to Jesus. Do you belong to him? My guess is probably most people in this room would say, yes, I belong to Jesus. Let me ask you maybe a deeper question. What part of you are you holding from Jesus? What part of you are saying, well, Jesus, you can have that part of my life, but I want this. Ah, that's something I wrestle with on a regular basis. And that's the invitation that Jesus gives. When Jesus was speaking to the Laodicean church, 
he was saying to them, you think you're wealthy. And they were. Financially, they had a lot of stuff. And he said, you don't realize you're poor. You're wretched. You're blind. He said, repent and turn to me and buy from me that which is pure. Clothing, salve for your eyes. And then he said to them, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation 3.20. I stand at the door and knock. What doors are keeping Jesus from us? He won't barge in, but he asks that we open it. Is there something in your life that's keeping you from Jesus? Maybe you've never invited Jesus into your life. Maybe you've never accepted the gift of grace. Today is the day. Maybe you look at the terrors of the world and you think, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? I can tell you this, I don't know, but he does. And he's promised to give us everything we need. Kingdom of this world, yeah, there's important things. Kingdom of heaven, that's everything. He wants your heart, your soul your mind and your strength. He wants you. He's jealous for you. What's keeping you from him today? Father in heaven, I ask that you would take this word and you'd speak to our hearts. Forgive us, Lord, when we have allowed the things of this temporal world to overwhelm us or distract us or keep us from you. Lord, thank you that you love our soul. You love what you are doing in us. Lord, thank you that you continually knock at the door. That we belong to you. Not because of anything we've done, but because of what you've done for us. Help us, Lord, to live our lives in such a way that it is unmistakable. that when the world sees us, they see you. In Jesus' name, amen. Invite you to stand.
Please join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. On the third day he rose again. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table so that all might be fed. Hear us now as we pray as a community of faith, gathered in worship, gathered for you. God of all that, God of all that is holy, you alone are in control of heaven and earth. Your change, you change times and seasons. You alone are sovereign. You impart wisdom and understanding to all who fear you. We confess that we are an insincere people. The more we have been given, the more we fear losing. Your goodness is in your understanding of our weaknesses. Some trust in world leaders and some in military might. Some trust in bank accounts and some in other people but we will put our trust in you, the living God. Fill us with your Spirit so that we may be wholly devoted to you and your sacred word. Let us pray. Amen. Jesus, our sure deliverer, we ask for comfort for all who grieve the death of loved ones. Heal the sick and the lame. In a world filled with misery and pain, we pray for those we silently name in our hearts at this time. Let us pray. Lord Almighty, we are your people, called by your name. A house divided cannot stand, so we come to you with humble and repentant hearts for the divisiveness in our country. Hear us as we cry out to you for forgiveness for the many ways we have squandered our God-given blessings and prosperity. Help us as a nation to turn from our selfish and sinful ways and love and honor you. May we help, may we keep all your commands so that we may once again be blessed to be a blessing to the many that live under siege by oppressive regimes. Let us pray. Help us to be faithful to you in all times and in all places. Give us the grace to accept the forgiveness that you have offered to each of us. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Receive now his benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, being reminded that in the sign of the cross, I belong to him. Amen. Amen.